when you're doing your own deals, yes, there's some good money in it, but it may be five years down the road before you see a lot of it. But by doing the equity fund, I could do a lot more deals and get a lot more small pieces rather than getting the big piece. Are you ready to break free from your corporate shackles and unlock your financial potential? Join me, David McElwain, on the electrifying journey of the Break Your Golden Handcuffs podcast. As a former golden handcuff wearer turned private equity real estate owner, I'm passionate about helping you turn your restraints into golden bracelets. Get inspired by the success stories of others who have transformed their corporate struggles into economic and personal freedom. Hi, everybody. David McElwain with the Break Your Golden Handcuffs podcast. Today, I've got a wonderful operator and equity person on the on the on the show, Jeff Greenberg. He's been in multifamily syndication and other forms of real estate syndication as an active operator for the last twelve years, and he has recently evolved his business more to the equity side. I'll let Jeff talk about this, obviously, as we go forward. And I met Jeff through a mutual networking group, and he's the guy that I always listen to with my head cocked, taking notes because whenever he talks, people listen. And with that, Jeff, give us a little bit of a 101 on who you are. Well, I call myself a, a recovering syndicator um, because I did, did syndicate for about 12 years, have one property left uh, to sell off. But now I'm in the private equity fund business and uh, helping people, uh, passive investors, get into quality deals and uh, enjoying myself quite a bit on this end of it. Yeah, it's a very fulfilling job, right? I mean, at least for me, when I help my investors get into quality deals, I always feel like I've done them a real service. Absolutely. And, yeah, it's a, it's a key thing. So tell me, uh, when we were talking before the show, you mentioned that you started this world while in a W-2 job and that you carried two torches, if you will. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you got into the, the recovering syndicator world. <laughs> Yeah, actually, um, I I had um, I was working a full time job in in the IT business, and I happened to be going through a divorce, and was talking with a friend um, about that he was going to get into real estate. I had no clue what that meant, um, but I had the opportunity to look at my finances, realizing that I was going to be splitting everything with my ex, and realized that that wasn't enough and decided I have to, had to do something. So I did start to look at uh, REOs, which is bank owned properties, um, single family homes. And that wasn't a great time to be doing that uh, in 2000, 2006, 2007. Yeah, there weren't uh, very many of them. Yeah, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a great time to be doing it. But the banks didn't know what to do with when they started on the foreclosures. And I didn't have that much money um, to work with and then uh, got into commercial real estate because I realized that I could use my money more for my education and be able to learn how to use other people's money to get into real estate deals. But all of this was, was you know, in between, you know, at my, during my lunch or in the morning. I'm in California so I could talk to Texas you know, before I went to work. So right. that work, the time zones uh, actually helped out quite a bit. Yeah. And that's the benefit of being on the West coast sometimes is that you get the win and tell you fly overnight to the East coast for an 8am yeah. call in, in Manhattan. Right. So what kind of, what kind of it work did you do? I was in the infrastructure, um, a network engineer. We basically kept the company running, um, you know, worked with servers, with routers and switches and, you know, just basically keeping our engineers. We were a, res a research and development uh, company and basically keeping our in engineers functioning by keeping yeah. the infrastructure going. And if the infrastructure dies, you guys got a lot of phone calls real fast. Oh, yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. or, or when one of the engineers decides to open up an email that has, has some kind of virus in it and all of a sudden it's hitting the company, so... Yeah, definitely fun times. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about, you know, golden handcuffs, because our listeners that we're talking with are people who often are in a W-2 world and they're, they're, they're restricted in one way, shape or form 
at least in their mind, either because they've got a way for options to vest or they've got a non-compete or they're making too much money to quit a job they don't like. And when you were in that role going through a divorce, which, by the way, I can totally relate to that, looking at your W-2 and then looking at your 401k and realizing you're going to lose half of it, that you got to go rebuild. You get into that thought process of what's next. So as you started picking real estate, was there anything specific that led you to that versus something else at that time frame? Well, I felt it was, you know, something that I could do. I didn't want to get into any of these uh, uh, multi-level marketing type of things. You know, those, I don't know. I just couldn't quite get into those. But real estate was something I could understand. And like I said, starting with a single family, I mean, that was something, you know, you could learn. But then I bumped into uh, somebody that was training on commercial real estate and that I could get into deals without much money of my own, if, if, if none at all. And I thought, OK, I have a limited amount of resources. A lot of my money was either tied up in, in uh, my retirement accounts, which I didn't have access to. Um, you know, I had to figure a way to get into it without a lot of extra money. Right. So it's almost a necessity requirement that you figure out a way to, yeah. to, to live within your parameters. And I think all exactly. of us face that at some point in time in our lives. So let's, yeah. let's, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now and uh, the, the, the evolution from syndicator and operator to equity guy and what kind of value that offers to people in corporate America. Yeah. Well, the one thing that, that I, that when you're the operator, you're, if you're the main guy, even if you have some partners, there's a lot of different hats that you're wearing. I mean, you're you're looking you're looking for deals. You're getting broker relationships. You're negotiating deals. If you get the deals, then you've got to worry about the loans and the operations and working with the property management companies and so many different things that you have to do. Oh, oh don't forget to, to uh, about raising the equity. You know, and investor relations, investor <laughs> relations, working with your investors, so many other things that you have to do. And you start realizing, OK, there's some things that I'm better at. There's some things that I like more than others. And if you're on a team where you can split things up, I mean, that's great. I've been on many different teams. I've had partners for you know five, six years and broke up with them and done other things with other people. Um I just decided that the part I liked the best was working with investors, educating investors, helping investors get into deals and learn this business. And I didn't care that much for the rest of it. And so I figured out after 12 years, <laughs> I'm a little slow, I guess, <laughs> um, that I could find real good operators and just help them with the equity side of it and let them do all the rest of the work. And that's kind of what got me into the, uh, into the equity funds is being able to bring people into my funds. And I thought years ago that I wanted to get into funds, but the problem is, is I didn't have enough deal flow. I needed to keep that money moving. You know, that, that I didn't want to start a fund, have people's money, and then uh, not have enough deals. Well, if I'm getting into other people's deals, there's a lot more deal flow because I could just find more more good sponsors that I could bring people into. Right. And it's almost all, an acceleration. It's almost a gas pedal you can step on. Absolutely. And the other thing is, is you know, you think about, okay, my, making money. Well, when you're doing your own deals, yes, there's some good money in it, but it may be five years down the road before you see a lot of it. Um, but by doing the equity fund, I could do a lot more deals and get a lot more small pieces rather than getting the big piece. You get a lot smaller pieces as a fund manager, but I could get a lot more of those and you know probably make up, you know, make as much money, if not more money, than I would if I was the operator. And it'd be a lot you know, a lot more enjoyable because that's what I enjoy doing. Now, now I did want to say one thing about, you know, on the funds. When I was, somebody approached me and told me that you can have what's called a, a customizable fund. 
that's when the lights went on. Right. Because a lot of times when you create a fund, it's fairly narrow focused. You know, and let's let's back up for a second and tell our listeners in case they don't know what a fund of funds is. And what he's talking about here, ladies and gentlemen, is that you pool investor money into basically a specific customizable private equity fund to invest in either a specific property or a specific asset class. And this came about as part of the SEC's changes with Rule 506B and 506C and under operating under a Regulation D in the SEC codes. And what this allows us to do is to create special purpose vehicles. And that's kind of what Jeff's digging into here, is the idea that you can create great returns with combined resources, which is another part of the crucial value of commercial real estate in and of itself. So with that, sorry, Jeff, to interrupt, let's keep talking on customizable private equity funds. Right. So with nor normally with a fund, you're either investing in, um, you're investing in other people's deals, or maybe you created a fund to do your own deals. But basically, it's an umbrella where everybody puts their money in, and then you could go buy those deals. And you got a specified reason for that umbrella to be there. Yes, you're going to specify it, and usually a fairly no narrow focus that you're going to be in this type of property and this type of region, and this is kind of what we're looking for in the returns. So you have some parameters, and that's typically how it's done because people are coming into a blind pool. Basically, they're coming in, and they're not going to be able to wait and see every single property and make choices if they want to be in a particular deal, you're putting a lot of trust in the person that's running the fund as far as picking those deals. Yeah, so I'm hearing this and I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm scared. I What makes me know that Jeff is the right guy to make these decisions for me? Mm -hmm. as, as a sales guy, I'm always thinking, I know better than everybody else in the room. And if you're a sales guy and you don't think that, well, you will eventually, I bet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So now, talk to me a little bit about that skill set. Well, let me go, let me go okay. on to the, the, the customizable part. So what I'm doing now is my fund is customizable, which people can pick and choose which deals they want to be part of. Okay. So I could have 20 people in my fund and they could be mix and matching and customizing which deals they want to be in. Deals they don't want to be in, they don't have to be in, and they can be in as many of those deals as you want as they come in. Now, the advantage that gives me is I, instead of having a narrow focus, I can have a very broad focus and say, okay, I'm going to be in, bring in commercial real estate deals, and I could have short-term rentals or self-storage or mobile home parks or RV parks or assisted living. And if somebody doesn't like a particular class, they don't invest in that. And it's so, all within the fund. So what I'm hearing is the fund can be basically diversified to different asset classes and or different regions as the offerings come out. Asset classes, asset types, sponsors. Um, I could diversify. Uh, I could do development as well. Um, we could do all kinds of different things. And each investor gets to choose which one they want to be in. So let's talk mechanics on that for a second. Okay. So let's say Jeff and David decide to work together and I send over $150,000 to Jeff's fund. And then Jeff, you get offerings. And do you send me each offering and I say yes or no? Well, typically we're going to do that even before you send the money. Okay. Uh, typically I'm going to say, okay, here's this offering that we're going to be bringing into the fund. Do you want to be in it? And then you'll go and send, okay, so, hey, I want to, I'm going to, I want to put a hundred thousand dollars in it. And so you go and send that over and sign the documents and you now have that your money in that offering. Now the next offering comes up and you say, okay, Hey, I want to be in that one also. Well, your hundred thousand is committed. So you would have to send in more for this new offering, but you're only sending the money in as the offerings come in and as you're interested in being in those. So inherently what you're doing is you're placing a – you're doing all the paperwork in advance to make the decisions instant almost. Yeah, I mean – And taking advantage of pooled resources. Would that be about right? Right. And the, and the investor, they're, 
the thing is, is they would sign one PPM, and that's a that's a a document for the SEC that they sign for the fund, but they don't have to sign that for all of the other opportunities. They only sign that once because they're already in the fund. And just so that for our listeners to know, in case you don't know what a PPM is, it's a private placement mem- memorandum. And what that spells out is what the rules are for every offering in that investment. And so that's the same whether you're buying a, any asset class, if you're buying a private equity, which is what inherently alternative investing is, you're going to have a PPM every time that tells you exactly what the risks are and what the rules are, how the business operates and and what the guiding principles are going to be for the operation in essence. And so signing one PPM saves you a lot of hassle and a lot of grief as an investor. Now we do, we do disclose the PPM for each of the opportunities so that people can read it and understand what opportunity they're getting into. And then they can make that decision of whether or not they want to be in that particular deal. But that way they can diversify. So this is interesting. I'm learning something about this as we go, because I had my training and my knowledge, and this is part of the fascinating thing about investing everybody, is that there is a wealth of different choice. I've always thought of them as single entity investments with single special purpose vehicles that are investing in either an asset class, class, a geography, an operator, et cetera. And so what Jeff is talking about is, is somewhat unique. So the question I have then is, what's the advantage of this fund over a different type of fund? Well, the main thing is on this type of fund, one, you get to make the choice of whether or not you want to be in it or not. And again, you only have to read the one PPM. Obviously, they have to you know, trust, trust the, the, the fund manager to bring in the deals. But we do disclose you know, uh, all of the information about an opportunity and people are able to, uh, to invest in it. Also, one, from the fund, you would get one K one, and instead of have, even if you were invested in ten different deals, you would still get one K one at the end of the day instead of ten K ones. And a K one is is what you get to report on your taxes as far as either your your your, your depreciation losses or your gains, uh, and that's something that goes into your taxes. Yeah, and that one K one means that in theory you're not having to assemble fifty different documents from fifty different operators to give to your CPA right, you know, right now. And the K one deadline to have received your K ones is March fifteenth, by the way. So if you haven't gotten it yet, your operators are late. Just as an FYI, because it's March twenty third when we're recording this. So it's not we record these before we send them out, obviously. And so it's a good reminder that there's if if you're a guy that has a desk that's messy, this is a great benefit. 1K1 makes your life a whole lot easier for your accountant and for yourself, and it probably saves you some accounting hours. Yeah. So uh, talk to me a little bit about this structure as a first-time investor. What have your clients said to you is scary about doing this versus what is not scary about it? Well, the one thing is is, is – People are a little leery about something different, uh, mm-hmm. and and getting into a fund, you know, to all my investors is is also something different. Um, they're not quite used to it. They may be used to just getting into an individual deal. the The advantage, though, is um, they still get to be the make the the final decision, the same as they would on any other deal. They make the final decision of whether or not they want to be into a particular deal. And so it still has that advantage. Um, But sometimes it's an extra layer that some people are concerned about, but I've had very few people ever mention anything about, you know, the, the issues with the extra layer of the fund. Yeah. What, what's the biggest benefit for the consumer to be in a fund of funds in your, or not the consumer, but your investors, what, do you, what is their biggest benefit to that as opposed to being project or property specific? Well, the one thing is, is they have me to, to find the deals for them. They have me, you know, the services that I provide are probably the biggest, the biggest benefit is a lot of people come up to me and say, how do you find, you know, how do you find good quality deals? And typically I come back to them and say, well, first of all, that's the wrong question. I say the, the first question you should ask is how do I find quality deal sponsors? And because that's the priority is getting the deal sponsors. So 
for the most part, they don't know how to find the deals or the deal sponsors, how to vet the deals or the deal sponsors. So by coming into my funds, they have the advantage of my services because I'm only bringing, you know, I'm only bringing the ones that I like. I'm throwing out the other ones and, you know, somebody that's still working, working their W-2 job um, may not have the time, knowledge or interest on figuring out what are the good deals and what are the good deal sponsors. Great point. I was talking with another friend of mine recently about this very item. You know, it's the leverage in a different form. You do what you do great and the things that you don't do great, you offload and you outsource to other team members. And so we were talking about what the top 1% do to invest differently than the rest of the world. And this capital person who's been in the business for decade and a half and has dealt with some very large, deep pocketed people shared, shared some of the knowledge. And that is that they hire experts in their fields. And so as a fund of funds guy, you're hiring an expert to do the, di the diligence that you need to do. I was thinking about the example of mowing my yard. At one point, I used to make $500 an hour at least when I was working. And so if I mowed my yard and it took me two hours because I'm a lazy old guy and I got a bald spot and I got to go in and rest and get some water and, you know, breathe and deal with the allergies and my sneezing, I figured it cost me $1,000 on a weekend to mow the yard. And my kids were younger and I didn't really want to spend that time mowing the yard. I wanted to spend it playing with them because my time was precious. I then realized that paying a guy 50 bucks a week to mow my yard saved me $950. Mm -hmm. And I got leverage. It actually gave me $950 a time. And I got leverage back. And this is what you're talking about, is the beauty of the leverage of somebody else's expertise. You know, I, I don't know if you ever read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell or not, but it talks about an expert. And it takes 10,000 hours to be considered an expert in any one field which in case you're doing the math is five consecutive years at 40 hours a week. So to your point, if you're doing a W-2 and let's say that you're an anesthesiologist, you can knock me out really well, pretty fast because you've done it thousands of thousands of times. And I'm sure Jeff, that you can smell a bad deal a thousand miles away because you've seen them thousands and thousands of times. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. And yeah. I mean, there's a lot of deals in, in five, 10 minutes. I could throw it out and say, I'm not doing this deal just because things in there that, that I know that I'm looking for um, that a lot of other people are missing. The expertise comes up super quick. And, you know, that anesthesiologist making 500 bucks an hour, it's going to cost him $5 million worth of his time to get to expertise. But he can bring someone in like Jeff or like myself in the private equity world and leverage our expertise and, and gain returns that are outperform the marketplace very quickly. Yeah, I'm saying with a, a doctor, you walk in the door and uh, you're coughing and sneezing or whatever it is, you know, they could probably diagnose it pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, where we wouldn't know if it's allergies or or COVID or whatever else it might be. And if I have an, if my network system goes down, I'm not calling my painter to come fix my network system. I'm calling a network engineer. And, yeah. you know, I think that this is a core part of the difference between the 90% and the 10% in the socioeconomic scales is the 90% at the bottom think they have to know it all. And the 10% at the top realize they bring in an expert. It's the same premise as the book uh, by Dan Sullivan called Who Not How. Mm -hmm. And the, have you read that book, Jeff? I recently read it and loved it. I don't know if you have or not. Yeah, I have read yeah. it. Yeah. And it's a, a while ago. Yeah. great illustration of – it's the questions that we ask give us the answers that we seek out. So if I want to invest, the normal person thinks, how do I invest? I have to go get educated. I have to go learn how to do due diligence. I have to learn all the magic hats as opposed to, oh, I need to find somebody like Jeff or David that actually has that expertise and I can leverage their skill set. Exactly. I mean, if you, if you know what the family offices are, uh, you know, people, families that have over a hundred million dollars, um, they're not looking for deals themselves. No, they don't have time for that. They don't have time for that. They're finding people that are finding the deals for them and then bring it to them. Yeah. And, and if you are wearing golden handcuffs and you're working 70 hours a week, you don't have time to do this. 
And so the most important thing you can do is look for the experts that you can trust. And I often talk about this, and Jeff, I'm curious your point of view. People talk about knowing, liking, and trusting somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think that liking them is immaterial. I think it's knowing them and trusting them. Because liking them can come and go, but trusting them is super important. What do you think? Well, the you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. But I think people invest with and like work with people that they like. I think that's that's part of it. I mean, I've got the greatest group of investors where I've talked to every single one of them and I know them fairly well. And there's other people that I've talked to that say, hey, I'd, you know, I'd rather they not invest with me because, you know, it's just they're going to just drive me nuts. So, you know, I, there is some aspect of liking in there that you you're going to deal with somebody that you like to work with. Absolutely. On that front, you know, that's that whole discussion around firing your client. That's that's too difficult. And that's one right. of the things about private placement is that there has to be a symbiotic relationship or a virtuous cycle in there of mutual respect. And the guy that that calls me and says, well, I didn't get my K-1 by March 1st. And you said it was going to come there on March 1st, but it comes on March 2nd and he lights me up. It's probably not the guy I want to do business with again, because it could have been that the mail just got delayed. You know, there's mm -hmm. a whole lot of stuff out there in this investing world that's not in our control. And Absolutely. I think I think that's a big part of it that as a as a passive investor, people have to think about is can I let go of control? Mm -hmm. No, I, and that and that is if you're going to come in as a passive investor, that is one of the issues that you need to be able to release the control and to be able to trust that person that you're releasing it to. Absolutely. Because as a passive investor, you have basically no control. Just like if you're buying a stock, share of stock in Apple, if I'm, I'm an Apple shareholder, if I call Tim Cook and say, Tim, I don't like the iPhone 15 model, he's going to say, talk to investor relations. And investor relations is going to say, delete. And it's not quite that extreme in the private placement world, but I think it's a fair analogy that you can have a, an investment where you have a relationship, but you're not really going to be the guy making the day-to-day -day decisions. Exactly. Yeah. So let's transition a little bit to the to kind of my perfunctory questions that I always love talking with people that have been in the world for a little while. And, and I ask a series of questions. And, and if you don't want to answer one, just say pass and we'll go to the next. But <laughs> what's the best piece of advice you wish you had had 10 years ago? Um, well, it's probably the same advice that I give people now when they ask about getting into the business. Okay. And, and typically, I mean, first of all, I tell people to get themselves educated by reading books, listening to podcasts, you know, go to conferences, that kind of thing. But also find somebody else that's doing what you want to do and find a way of being of service to them, finding a way to help them out in whatever way you can. It could be making phone calls. It could be boots on the ground. It could be bringing in money. It could be any of these things. And being close to somebody that has experience is the best education that you can get. Yeah, that that the 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 school of, of reality and the school of actually doing is so very different from the school of academia, right? Absolutely. I mean, but you need you need some basis so you're not a burden on that busy person. You want to have some basis. And I've and I've had people come to me and say, hey, will you mentor me? And I said, well, what have you done for yourself? And they said, well, I'm just starting out. And I said, well, here, here's a couple books. Read these books and come back. And then and we'll talk. Do, again. do they? No. <laughs> <laughs> typically, typically not. And you know, they, I give them an assignment and they don't do it. And I said, well, okay, it worked out because they would have failed anyway if they're not going to go and follow through on anything. Right. And it's it's one of those things where I used to have I used to run a sales force and some small, some new sales guy would come in and say, Hey, Mr. Executive, how do I win? And I'd say, do A, B, C, D, and let's talk in two weeks. And he'd come back in yeah. two weeks because he was working for me, so he had to, and he had done F. And, yeah. you know, then you put them on a PIP, uh, you know, good old fashioned performance improvement plan. And 90 days later, the guy's out the doors because he's not doing a B. He's not doing it. And that's a great test. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's it's not a it's not a complex business, but it is work. And I tell people, you know, it's not a get rich quick business. 
you know, it's get rich over the long haul. It's a get rich slowly. Exactly. Yeah. When we talk about deals that are five, seven, 10 year holds, that's not quick. And not every deal. You know, I think a lot of investors have been spoiled from 2018 to 2022. And they think that if you're not getting a 28% internal rate of return and a 3x equity multiple in two years, the deal sucks. Well, the reality is that that's not repeatable over the long haul. It's like buying Netflix at three. You can't buy Netflix at three anymore because it's past that window. And Apple is, I don't know, the same example. You know, the Fang stocks, if we talk about them, are, are the same example. You want to go back in time, but you can't because the marketplace constantly dynamically changes. Well, the thing is that's interesting about real estate is it's cyclical. And so maybe you can't go back and get Apple stock at a dollar, but you can get some great deals on real estate because when it starts dropping down, and I think this is a fabulous time to be getting started in the business, to be learning about the business, because I think in the next six to 12 months, we're going to see a lot of correction. And no, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of opportunities coming uh, because of the raise in interest rates and and the stress that's going to be uh, on on a lot of the people that have loans right now. A lot of the uh, beginning investors don't understand that the number one cost in a syndication or any real estate is usually the debt. Mm -hmm. well, and that's your biggest investor. That's your biggest investor. Period. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. The debt makes or breaks every single deal. Absolutely. That's why I'm this last property that I haven't sold off yet. We have no debt on it. We own we own it outright. So, you know, whenever whenever we could sell it, we'll sell it <laughs> as you choose. <laughs> yeah, we want to sell it. It's, I've had it for six years. But uh, the, the thing is, is we can wait it out. Yeah. And, there's, and, and to your point, we are in a cycle. We're in a downward cycle right now. Yeah. And we're going to continue to be that way for a little while. So, uh, great, so. Gr great piece of advice. Uh, what's the worst piece of advice you've ever followed in your career? That I've ever followed. Or heard and said, oh, that's a bunch of hooey. I'm not touching that one with a 10-foot pole. Uh, God, I, I'll have to pass on that one. I can't even think of that I, that I didn't. The worst that I didn't follow or the worst piece of advice you did follow, you did well, follow. Of, I don't know that that I've really had any advice that I did follow, except well, okay. There's, you know, when when it was going to, when I was looking for a partner, I guess the advice was, you know, find someone that's kind of do, you know, at the same place you are uh, in the education process, right? Um, I've heard people say that and I've said, no, 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 don't get, you know, if you're going to partner up, try to find someone that's a little bit ahead of you, you know, a few steps ahead of you where I met this, this lady and we worked very well together, but we were both real beginners. And so we were both fumbling along together. So that was probably bad advice. Um, and I tell people, find somebody, if you're going to partner with somebody, Find someone that's a few steps ahead where you could be learning from them as well. Absolutely. And, and another piece of advice I got that was similar is if you're looking for a partner, find someone who is, uh, if you're older and you find someone who's a little bit younger because they have more energy and drive. Really, <laughs> I mean, it was a really pragmatic piece of advice. Once once you hit certain ages, certain things start to, you, your energy and drive changes. And the converse of that is that if you're younger, you look for a guy that's a little bit older and ahead of you in business decisions. You yeah, know, well, my first my first partner, business partner, she was energetic. She was energetic. She was driven. And, and I loved it because every time we'd go to do due diligence, she'd have everything listed out, what we we're supposed to do. And I just say, OK, let's go. Right. <laughs> and she was out there. She was the eager beaver and loved due diligence. So that, that part was good. But a lot of the other things we were, you know, both fumbling along learning. And that's OK, too, because this is a place where you can learn. And someone said to me, the only way to screw up real estate is to sell at the wrong time. 
Don't know if I agree with that fully, but you know, it's an interesting thought process that if you buy the real estate and you operate it soundly, it's pretty hard to screw it up. Well, you could buy wrong too. You can. I've seen you pay too much and you're squeezing too much um, if you don't and, have enough uh, reserves. And you're yeah. waiting a long time for those cycles to go to get back to happy. That's for sure. Well, that's that's the thing that we're going to be seeing more of now is more of a yield play rather than the value add where it's going to take longer to get those kind of returns that we're seeing in two and three years or, you know, where it could take a six, seven, you know, 10 year hold to get the kind of returns that we're seeing previously. And it, so that's a new reality. And I think that's something that's important to talk about if we could dive into that for a second. You know, the average stock market return over the life of the stock market has been between seven to eight percent. Mm-hmm. And when you get an IRR of a 13 or a 12, you're getting about an 11% average annual return. Mm-hmm. And people often think of this as an apples to oranges comparison. They think of real estate as an IRR analysis, and they think of the stock market as an annual return analysis, which inherently is, is not comparing the two over the same metric. And I think that you're right. This, there's gonna, there is going to be a lot of yield play, which is going to lend to steady eddy returns that are mm-hmm. greater than the stock market without the volatility. Sure. And that's what we're going to see in this cycle. Yeah. But people have been spoiled. And, and so it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I've had, I had a deal that we, we've had a 40% uh, annualized return. In three years, they got 120% return. You know, but that's not going to happen every day. You know, as a sales guy, that's when you hit it out of the park and you hit your quota in the first quarter and you have quarters two, three, and four to build against your comp for next year and you know you're sunk. That deal sinks sinks your comp for the next year, right? (laughs) So, hey, uh, is there a thought or a quote or something that moves you day in or day out or something that is an axiom or a North Star that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, the the one thing that I, I like to tell people and, and I and including my grandkids is, you know, to push yourself that you don't grow in your comfort zone. That Oh, I in, love that. In, in, in your comfort zone, yeah, you're you're comfortable, but you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not pushing yourself. And so you need to push yourself out of your comfort zone and you know, be uncomfortable and that's when you're gonna gain the most. And yeah, sometimes you might fall down, but you're just going to need to get back up and keep on going. But you need to push your comfort zone. I love that. You're not going to grow in your comfort zone. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Jeff. And then when I'm I'm teaching my little granddaughter how to ride her bike, you know, it's you're you're going to fall sometimes. <laughs> you are. You're going to get a scraped up knee, and then this is how you develop the skills to get back up and get on that bike again. That's right. Yeah. Make her wear a helmet. I've had a helmet save my life twice. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely wear the helmet. And yeah. She didn't like the knee pads, though. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard riding a bike with knee pads. It is. So tell, tell us and our listeners, how can we connect with you if you want to continue this conversation? Because you've got some really interesting opportunities in, in, in front of the world. Well, you can go to my website, which is synergeticig.com. That's S-Y-N-E-R-G-E-T. I C I G dot com, or you could write me at Jeff at synergetic I G dot com. Um, those are probably the best ways. And, and I do have a gift for your, for your audience. Um, it's questions to ask a deal sponsor before you get into a deal. And you could get that at S I G C R E dot com slash sponsor. And it's a bunch of questions to ask before you get in a deal as a passive. And if you're going to be an active investor, it's questions that you should have answers to. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, a, that's, I'm sure that knowledge was gained in the school of reality. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you so much for coming on. And to our listeners, you've been listening to the Break Your Golden Handcuffs podcast. I'm David McElwain with Jeff Greenberg here and appreciate your time. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us this week. If you want to learn more, visit BreakYourGoldenHandcuffs.com 
and join our investment club. We have a ton of information and education available. And don't forget, hit the subscribe button today. Go on. You know you want to get passively invested.